Good afternoon and welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is David Bowes and I'm delighted to have you all here. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Institute and I'll be chairing things today. Our topic today is why Darwin matters or does he? Um, it's a fundamental issue. Is the theory of evolution the foundation of modern biology or if it's not, what is? And is the opposition to Darwinian evolution genuine science or is it religion in disguise? Now some people might argue that libertarians could choose to be conscientious objectors in this argument. After all, scientists can debate their differences without any government involvement, so scientific disputes don't need to be part of public policy. One of the ways this issue touches on public policy, of course, is in the schools. Should American schools teach evolution? or creation, or intelligent design, or some combination. When I was in college in the 1970s, the Tennessee legislature passed a law saying that the schools must teach all theories of creation. And uh, I was at Vanderbilt, and smart aleck Vanderbilt professors started writing op-eds saying, well, that means they're going to have to teach the Iroquois myth of the sky people, and the theory that the Earth sits on the back of a giant turtle, and hundreds of other theories of creation. Um, I think eventually they had to uh, come up with a different uh, law there. For libertarians, of course, there's an easy answer to this question. Privatize the schools. Depoliticize the schools. That's how we depoliticize religion. Instead of fighting over how we should worship, we agreed that we'll all worship as we choose and the government won't direct the way in which we worship. Similarly, we could depoliticize the schools, let everybody attend private schools, let every school teach what it chooses, let parents choose the school that teaches what they want their children to learn. But we don't have that situation right now. Most American children go to government-run schools. And as long as we have public schools, then people are going to care what their kids are taught. Um, and certainly, as long as there are public schools. If my kids were going to them, I would want them taught the best science. We will have some discussion today, I think, of what the best science is. But now it's time to let our speakers address these issues. I'm going to, address, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, and then I will be back up here to introduce our commenter later. Um, Dr. Michael Shermer is the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine and the executive director of the Skeptics Society. He's contributing editor and monthly columnist for Scientific American. A few years ago, he uh, produced and co-hosted a Fox Family television series, Exploring the Unknown. He's the author of several books, including Science Friction, Where the Known Meets the Unknown, about how the mind works and how thinking goes wrong. His book, The Science of Good and Evil, Why People Cheat, Gossip, Share, Cure, uh, Care, and Follow the Golden Rule is on the evolutionary origins of morality and how to be good without God. And I think his best-selling book was Why People Believe Weird Things, uh, which can cover a wide variety of topics. He received a PhD in the history of science from Claremont Graduate School, and he's here today to discuss his book, Why Darwin Matters, The Case Against Intelligent Design. Please welcome Michael Shermer. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me here. Good to be here on the right coast. I'm from Southern California. We're on the left coast over there. Uh, where we, uh, we hang out at Caltech, we are the Skeptic Society. The, the magazine Skeptic is the quarterly publication of the society. We investigate claims of the paranormal, pseudoscience, fringe groups, and cults, and claims of all times, uh, all kinds between uh, uh, science and junk science and voodoo science and pathological science and bad science and non-science and plain old nonsense. And unless you've been abducted by aliens and on another planet recently, you've noticed there's a lot of nonsense out there. Some people call us debunkers, but let's face it, there's a lot of bunk. Somebody's got to do it, and that's half of our job, is to uh, explain what's really going on, expose the bunk, like the bunko squad of the police departments. Uh, it's, it's our job to clean up the bad ideas in society, particularly in science. Um, but that's only half the job. The more interesting part of my job, I think, is uh, not what the particular beliefs are, whether they're true or not, but why people believe them. That is the psychology of beliefs. Uh, 
whether it's uh, Holocaust deniers, I wrote a whole book about these guys, uh, do they really believe that the Holocaust didn't happen? Yeah, they really do believe it. They're not just saying it to sell books because they don't really sell books uh, very well on that topic. And uh, they really actually believe that. Uh, of late, probably I've gotten more interviews in the last uh, three weeks than almost anything I've ever done on 9-11 conspiracy theories. These are people who believe that uh, the Bush administration, which they also believe is the most incompetent administration to ever inhabit the White House, is also somehow orchestrated the most incredibly complex, powerful conspiracy of all time uh, in one of the same uh, one of the same person. So I find that uh, very fascinating that somebody can hold in the logic tight compartments of their brain these two com uh, sort of competitive ideas. Um, so we do pick and choose topics that are important. Uh, to culture, we've never done any uh, stories on the Flat Earth Society, for example, because the one and only member who was also the president died a couple years ago uh, is not a big force in, in American cultural life. But on the other hand, t topics like uh, evolution and creation or evolution and intelligent design are. So that's what Kay led me to, to write uh, Why Darwin Matters. So I, I will do a little bit of reading and talking from the book uh, in my time here uh, to give you a feel for. Um, uh, what I think is actually going on here. Um, uh, my doctoral dissertation, uh, David mentioned in the history of science, was actually on uh, evolutionary theory, specifically on Alfred Russell Wallace, who was the co-discoverer of natural selection along with Darwin. Toward the end of his life, uh, Wallace could not for the life of him figure out how natural selection could account for things like the big brain, the size of our brain compared to other primates, for example or our ability to do mathematics, higher reasoning uh, like mathematics, aesthetic appreciation. Why is it we should appreciate uh, a beautiful sunset or a, a, a musical composition? Uh, wh what, what could account for that in, in natural selection, in, out, out in the Paleolithic environment in which we evolved? He could not figure it out. And so he attributed uh, it to something inherent, inherently directional or teleological, spiritual, something else from the top down. Not this bottom-up, grindingly slow mechanism of natural selection, but something infused into the universe, the cosmos, into us. Uh, he wasn't a, a religious person in any traditional sense, so he didn't believe in a personal God, but he felt that there was design built into the system. And in 1903, he wrote a book uh, called Man's Place in the Universe, in which he basically presented these arguments and showed that uh, we are really still special uh, in the universe. We do have a special place. We are centrally uh, located, at least in a spiritual sense, and we are designed in a very special way. His book was reviewed by none other than Mark Twain, who uh, I think demolished the argument with his clever literary style better than anybody. So this is back in 1903. So I'll read you what is my favorite quote from, from my book, um, from Mark Twain. Man has been here 32,000 years. That it took 100 million years to prepare the world for him is proof that that is what it was done for. I suppose it is. I don't know. If the Eiffel Tower were now representing the world's age, the skin of paint on the pinnacle knob at the summit would represent man's share of that age, and anybody would perceive that that skin was what the tower was built for. <laughs> I reckon they would. I don't know. It is next to impossible for us to get out of our sense that we are special. This is just built into the system, and it's hard for any of us, even scientists, even Mr. Natural Selection himself, Wallace, who called himself more Darwinian than Darwin, uh, still could not get, get out of that. Um, so then I continue here um, um, with the question of why do you believe in God? I've been asking people this question most of my adult life, and in 1998, Frank Sullaway and I presented the query in a uh, more formal uh, form, uh, format along with the question, why do you think other people believe in God? We gave this in a survey to 10,000 Americans. <clears throat> the number one reason people gave for why they believe in God is the good design, natural beauty, perfection, complexity of the world and the universe. It looks designed, therefore it was designed. Interestingly, when we asked them, why do you think other people believe in God? Uh, that answer dropped down to sixth place in the various answers. The number one answer uh, people gave for why they think other people believe in God is that God is comforting, relieving, consoling, and gives meaning and purpose to life. In other words, I believe in God because of these, these intellectual reasons of it's, it's complex, it's designed, and, they, and they, they wrote these answers in these long essays to us that we then coded, uh, in which they made the design argument. Uh, for, for, for a rational reason for why, 